wonderful sea of faces. This is terrific, and thank you all for being resourceful enough to find us here in 150 Columbia instead of down at Lillis, where we were for the first two talks. My name is Barbara Altman. I'm the director of the Oregon Humanities Center, and I'm very happy to be the first to welcome you to this evening's talk, which is the third in a series of six celebrating the bicentennial of Darwin and the sesquicentennial, a word I love and use as often as I possibly can, <laughs> the sesquicentennial of his landmark book on the origin of species. As you may have noticed over the last few months, Darwin is getting a lot of press. He was the cover boy of the, the science section of the February 10th New York Times, which happened to be the date of the talk by Warren Holmes, the second event in this series. And we're certainly only one of many, many institutions in this country and around the world which have taken Darwin and his work as the subject of special events for the year. Our series includes four faculty members from the U of O. We began with Patrick Phillips in January, who's also one of the major organizers. And then we heard Professor Holmes in February. Tonight our presenter is Professor Thornton, Joe Thornton, who will be followed next month by Francis White. May will bring two outside speakers. The first of those is Sean Carroll from the University of Wisconsin, who is coming on May 4th, as the Oregon Humanities Center's 2008-2009 Robert D. Clark lecturer. And then closing the series will be Kenneth Miller from Brown University, who will deliver the OHC's 0809 Criticos lecture to close this series on May 27th. We're also going to be taking Professor Kenneth Miller up to Portland to do the lecture there, so if you have connections in Portland, you can alert them to this lecture there on May 28th. I'll be brief because I'm just the first of two introducers. The Oregon Humanities Center, my unit, is one of the co-sponsors of this event, but there are many others. They are the Center for Ecology and Evolutionary Biology, the Institute for Molecular Biology, the Institute of Neuroscience, the Museum of Natural and Cultural History, the Department of Biology, and the College of Arts and Sciences. We're especially pleased at the Oregon Humanities Center to be working on these lectures and on a number of other projects with the natural sciences this year. I want to acknowledge our associate director, Julia Hayden, who enthusiastically leapt at the chance to collaborate on this series when Patrick mentioned it. I also want to thank the other members of the OHC for their hard work. A lot goes into running a lecture series of this kind. And um, also, you might have seen our striking poster. So much appreciation to Melissa Gustafson, Peg Gearhart, Dylan Bragg, and Noel Alloway. Have a look at the poster on your way out, if you wish, and make note of the dates of the other three offerings still to come. You can also find all of the relevant information anytime you want it on the Oregon Humanities Center website. For now, however, and without further ado, let's get to the heart of the matter. So I will pass off to Patrick, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you for coming. Good evening. Uh, uh, my name is Patrick Phillips. I'm in the biology department in the Center for Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. I'm standing in for uh, Dietrich Bellitz, who's the uh, Associate Dean of Science, who unfortunately came down with the flu. So uh, I get the honor of introducing Joe Thornton this evening. And it's a great honor indeed. Um, Joe is an Associate Professor in the biology department and is also a member of the Center for Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And Joe came to the university in 2002 after receiving his undergraduate degree in English, interestingly enough, uh, from Yale, um, and then getting a master's and PhD from Columbia University. Um, Joe has a, a fascinating career path that I don't have time to get into, but it involves uh, immediately after his undergraduate career working um, at Greenpeace as their point person on uh, uh, the effects of chlorinated compounds uh, on the environment and on humans, which led to an interest in artificial disruptors, uh, like environmental estrogens of steroid receptors, which led to an interest in the uh, evolution of these receptors and their ligands. So it's a great model for any students that are in the audience of just following uh, where your love is, and uh, it's a great uh, testament for uh, sort of the American educational system, I think. 
So Dr. Thornton and his lab have written, I think, some of the most influential papers in uh, evolutionary biology over the last five years, and these have been published in uh, the journal Science and Nature and many other journals. Um, science and Nature are the top journals in all of science, um, and uh, we'll be getting, a, I think, a good glimpse of that work this evening. So all this great work has not only been recognized by these journals, but also by uh, major award groups, and I actually have to read these because there's so many. Uh, so some of uh, Dr. Thornton's awards include the National Science Found Foundation Career Award, Alfred P. Slo Sloan Foundation Fellowship in Molecular and Computational Biology, a Richard A. Bray Faculty Fellowship from the University of Oregon, an award for faculty excellence, which is also from the UO, and uh, most recently, a U.S. White House Presidential Early Career Award for scientists and engineers. So uh, of the 20 or so recipients of this award, they all traveled to the White House, and they got to meet uh, with then President Bush. And so the president's surrounded by really the greatest mo young minds in science at, at, of their age. What would he ask them? Um, <laughs> So Joe reports that he talked about his dog. Um, <laughs> it may never get old to, uh, to bash the science. So just two days ago, or maybe it was yesterday, I've, I've lost track of time, two days ago, Dr. Thornton learned that he had been, uh, he's been awarded an early career scientist appointment in the Howard Hughes Medical Institution, which is one of the most pre prestigious and I must say lucrative awards in the life sciences. Um, and so I think you can see that uh, Joe has an unusual talent for identifying important problems and also communicating them not only to uh, the rest of the scientific community, but uh, hopefully to the community at large. So without further ado, Joe. Patrick, thank you for the introduction and for all your work organizing this series, and also thank you to the Humanities Center. I think the incredible attendance at these events really speaks to a great appetite among the, pub among the public for this sort of event, this sort of outreach from the university to, to the community. Uh, how many people have attended the other events in the series? So thank you for downgrading to coach. Patrick got to give his lecture in the executive first class auditorium. <laughs> so 1859 was a long time ago. When Darwin's Origin of Species was published, there were no cars, no electricity, no chewing gum, no Eugene, Oregon. And even harder for me to imagine, no one knew anything about molecular biology and genetics. Now the true test of a scientific theory is its ability to incorporate, explain, and predict future observations, including phenomena that can't even be imagined at the time the theory is formulated. So how does Darwin's theory stand up in the age of molecular biology? Remarkably, even triumphantly well. So what I'd like to do tonight is to show you a number of ways in which the discoveries of modern biology have actually strengthened Darwin's theory making it perhaps the most compelling and encompassing theory in all of modern science. Is it not, not happening? You okay? So Darwin set out to provide a historical explanation for the incredible diversity of life on the planet. Now he was a brilliant naturalist with encyclopedic knowledge of plants and animals and other species, but of course he had no clue about the mechanisms by which the diversity of their forms was produced. He knew nothing about genomics, he knew nothing about DNA, he knew nothing about proteins, he knew nothing about molecular and cellular biology. Even the basic laws of inheritance hadn't been discovered yet. Now, because Darwin could observe the output, but not the process by which it was produced, creationists in recent decades have called this situation Darwin's black box, that molecular biology is uh, sort of this sealed set of phenomena that Darwin didn't know about and couldn't explain. 
And they've argued that what's inside the box can't be explained by, by evolutionary biology. That what's inside the box is too complex to have evolved and must have been created by a divine designer. So tonight I want to show you that when we open up that box, as biologists have been able to do over the last few decades, what we see is entirely consistent with and even strengthens the case for Darwin's ideas. So let's start with a quick review of Darwin's major claims. So he makes two major claims in The Origin of Species. The first is common descent. He says that species are not created specially by a divine agent, but species are produced continually by a process of lineage splitting and divergence from common ancestors. So populations split from each other, do not exchange genetic material, evolve independently, leading to the first tree of life drawing ever in Darwin's notebooks, common ancestors giving rise to present day lineages with today's species at the tips. Now some of the most powerful evidence for this observation was the great underlying unity of type, the structural similarity that's obvious when one looks inside organisms. Second major claim, adaptation occurs by natural selection. So adaptation means the remarkable fit of organisms to their environment and their lifestyles. So Darwin's claim was that traits that increase survival and reproduction in an, in an organism's environment become more common over generations and eventually become fixed. Now there are three conditions that are required for this process to occur. And if those conditions are present, natural selection must occur. Here are those conditions. First, there has to be inheritance. Grandchild has to look like grandfather. Second condition, there has to be variation. So individuals have to differ from each other, and those differences have to be heritable. And finally, there has to be unequal or differential reproduction. Some individuals are more likely to survive and leave more offspring than others. And if that is true, then the individuals that leave more offspring will pass their traits onto, their, onto more offspring in the next generation. And the next generation, its composition, will have more of those traits. Eventually, they will become fixed. So a classic example is uh, the mouse, the beach mouse, and the mainland mouse in Florida. A major predator is the hawk. Uh, on the beach mouse has white coloration, which uh, gives it camouflage on the, on the white sands. The, the brown mouse lives in, uh, in the darker colored brown forest ecosystem. So the idea is that if you have a population made up of both types on, in the beach environment, the white ones will leave more offspring and eventually the population will be all white. And if you had a similarly mixed population in this environment, the brown ones will leave more offspring and eventually you get an all brown population. But here's the problem. When Darwin was writing, he had no idea about the laws of inheritance and no idea how heritable variation is produced. And this was a major problem for the acceptance of the theory of adaptation by natural selection. Now let's flash forward approximately 100 years to the early days of molecular biology, the 50s and the 60s, and a little bit into the 70s. We now understand how, how variation and inheritance proceed. And the mechanism is entirely consistent with those conditions that are required for Darwin's theory. So here's a little molecular biology review. Um, the material, the chemical, the molecule of inheritance is DNA, of course. DNA is a string of four different, uh, four different chemical units that can be put together in any order. And that DNA can be uh, transcribed into a copy, a form of RNA, which has a very, which has a sequence based on the sequence of its template. And RNA is modified, it has some marks on it that let it uh, be recognizable and let it go through the next process, which is translation into a string of amino acids or a protein. The string of, of units in the RNA determines the string of amino acids. And the properties, the chemical properties of the 20 different amino acids cause them to interact with each other in different ways. And this string of amino acids, depending on its specific sequence, 
folds up into a three-dimensional structure, and that three-dimensional structure allows it to do specific kinds of work in the cell, uh, to act as an enzyme and carry out chemical reactions, to serve as a structural component of the cell, to regulate other processes in the cell. So that's how DNA produces the organism, the phenotype. Now, what about the inheritance and variation part? Well, DNA is passed from one generation to the next through the gametes. And if DNA is passed in the exact same form, then it will yield the exact same protein and you get a very similar organism. Now, what about variation? Well, mutations occur, errors in the process of copying DNA, and if there is an error in the DNA, it shows up in the RNA and it may change the protein. And that change in the protein may subtly change the way it folds and may change the way it functions. And once those mutations occur, if they're in the germline, the sperm or the egg, uh, the, or in the cells leading to them, then those will be passed on to future generations. So all of the conditions required for adaptation by natural selection are fulfilled by the discoveries in molecular biology, these core discoveries. Okay. Now let's come into the current decade, the, uh, around the year 2000, the beginning of genomic sequencing of entire genomes, three billion of these units in the human genome, determining the, the exact order of them in humans and a number of other species have been sequenced as well. But what are some of the insights? Powerful evidence for common ancestry. The human and chimp sequences can be compared to each other and the DNA is more than 99% identical depending on how you measure it. There are a few stretches that are 98% identical, but the vast majority are about 99% or more identical. Remarkably, our Share, evidence of shared ancestry goes way back further than our common ancestor with chimpanzees. If you look at the catalog of genes in humans and in other genomes that have been sequenced, less than 1% are unique to humans. A full 99% are shared with other vertebrates all the way back to, uh, to fish. A full 77% are shared with other animals like flies and worms. You share half of your genome with plants and mushrooms or the yeast that uh, made your beer. And fully 21% of your genome, it, you, the ancestry can be traced back to our common ancestor with bacteria. What about developmental genetics? Scientists studying the molecular basis for, for the development of the embryo. Well, one key insight has been the discovery of a shared toolbox of key genes that regulate development throughout the animal kingdom. So in the fly embryo, for example, the genes that set up the basic identity from the head to tail are the same genes that uh, regulate very similar processes in the development of the mouse embryo. So processes are shared and they're often very poorly designed. And this tells us something about the thesis that we have to look to a divine creator because these processes are so exquisitely wrought. So let's take an example of suboptimal design at the molecular level. Chickens do not have webbed feet. Ducks have webbed feet. We know something about why that is true thanks to developmental uh, molecular geneticists. So during development, oh, and the webbed foot is derived. It is uh, derived from an ancestor that did not have webbed feet. So this is the ancestral condition more or less, and this is the derived condition. So interestingly, the way to make a chicken foot is during development to have a webbed foot and then to turn on a process of programmed cell death that eats up the webbing. So that's fairly inefficient. Um, why not just make this, um, why not just make this foot in the first place? We know some of the genes that regulate, that turn on this process of progr programmed cell death, bone morphogenic proteins. So you might think that in the duck, which does, which has its webbed foot, that this would never be turned on. But in fact, it is turned on. It is expressed in the web during the process of development of the duck foot. Ducks have something else, expression of another gene that inhibits the activity of BMP 
in turning on programs delta x. Now, it would have been a lot better if you were designing this just to make the webbed foot not turn on the program cell death at all, certainly not to turn on the gene to turn it on and then have another gene to turn it off. <laughs> another example is the presence of vestigial genes in the genome called pseudogenes, which are truly junk. So, Here's a diagram of what a pseudogene is and how a certain type of pseudogene is, is generated. So here's the genome, and here's a, a gene of interest that is uh, expressed. This means it's expressed into these RNA transcripts. And here's the, here's the control region that turns on the expression. Under some, some conditions, these transcripts can be copied back into DNA at some random location, more or less random. So I've drawn it on the same chunk of genome, but this could be on another chromosome. It probably is on another chromosome. It's copied back, and it has the marks of an RNA, so we know that it comes from the transcript. And it also lacks the control region, because the control region doesn't get uh, put into this transcript. So you get this sort of junk copy, this remnant, that isn't expressed. And over time, it accumulates more and more mutations. This isn't doing anything. It's not capable of doing anything. But the genome is littered with these things. So one question is, why are they there? They're there because they're not really doing much harm. They're just taking up space. They're like stuff in your attic. But they serve as markers of common ancestry. So um, in a 2000 paper, Friedberg and Rhodes traced the presence of several specific pseudogenes in a number of primate species and an outgroup, the rodents. And the first one they looked at was a pseudogene of a gene called calmodulin. Um, and they found that it was present in all of the primates. The second one they looked at is an enzyme that was present in all of the old world monkeys, but not the new world monkeys or the rodents. The third one, a different pseudogene of calmodulin in a different place, is found only in the apes. And a third one, a different enzyme, is found only in humans, chimps, and gorillas. Now, this hierarchical organization is perfect evidence of the process of phylogeny. This tree that explains the distribution of these pseudogenes is exactly the same tree that explains the evolution of gene sequences and the evolution of morphological characters as well. So Darwin actually talked about vestigial traits, like the shrunken wings of the emu. He had no idea that, that such a thing could exist in genomes because there were no genomes to know about at the time. But our findings are perfectly consistent with his line of reasoning. What about adaptation by natural selection? Well, there have been a slew of studies in recent years describing precisely the genetic mechanisms by which new adaptive phenotypes evolve. And I was talking about the beach mouse. Well, Hopi Hoekstra and colleagues has uh, discovered in large part the mechanism for this. She's found that the beach mice, the white ones, um, have a mutation in a specific gene in the pathway for producing pigment. So if this is a pigment producing cell, and here's the pigment that's produced, she found that there's a mutation in a receptor. This is a receptor on the cell surface which is capable of turning on a signaling pathway that regulates the production of the pigment. And it only does that when a, when a protein in the blood binds to it specifically. Now, there's a mutation in the beach mice, a, a, single, a single change in the DNA sequence that causes this receptor not to, uh, not to initiate this process and turns off melanin production. So it's quite clear that adaptation by natural selection can proceed by fairly simple genetic uh, mechanisms under certain cases. In other cases, it's more complex. But a question arises here, where does a system like this come from in the first place? And this is what the creationists are most worried about recently. This gets us to the question of complexity. How do complex biological systems evolve? Now, the classic model of for the evolution of complexity, going back to Darwin, is that complex systems are the result of a gradual process of elaboration and optimization under the influence of selection. And this has been amply demonstrated for the case of the eyes of animals, for example, under selection for greater visual acuity from more primitive light-sensing organs. 
But that explanation seems like it breaks down when we start considering molecular systems in which the function of one part depends on its interaction with, with another part. So here's the structure of a, of a steroid hormone in complex with its, uh, with its receptor. How do we explain the evolution of a new hormone if there's not already a receptor to uh, transduce its signal? And conversely, how do we explain the evolution of a new receptor if there's not already a hormone to give it a function? Creationists have seized upon this idea and called it irreducible complexity. They say that a system like this can't evolve because the function of each part doesn't exist unless the entire system is present all at once. So it can't evolve by a gradual process. This is a modern version of the classic argument from design, the watchmaker argument, that if you're walking in the forest and you find a, you find a watch and you open it up and you're like, gee, look at all these gears, they fit together perfectly. Somebody made this watch, it didn't just come together at random. They argue that cellular and molecular processes have the same irreducible complexity. They can't be pieced together stepwise. Now Darwin was well aware of this, of this puzzle. He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. And he continued, in order to discover the early transitional grades through which the organ has passed, we should have to look to very ancient ancestral forms long since become extinct in order to trace out the stepwise assembly of these sorts of, uh, these sorts of organs and structures. Now this is a real problem for molecular biology because DNA is seldom preserved well over long periods of time, so we don't have molecular fossils that we can turn to. But in recent years, a new strategy for research in molecular evolution has emerged called uh, ancestral gene resurrection that lets us deal with this challenge. So this is what we do in my lab, as you can see here. <laughs> and for the rest of the talk, I'm going to tell you about some of our discoveries concerning the evolution of complexity in hormones and receptors. So here's what this strategy is that we use. The process of resurrecting an ancestral gene, the purpose of it is to be able to do experimental work to empirically determine what the functions of ancestral genes were and how their functions changed due to specific mutations over time. So we begin with present day gene sequences of the gene we're interested in from many species. And we can infer the phylogeny, the tree of life that relates those species and sequences to each other. So this shows you um, a made up gene for a bunch of vertebrates, and suppose we're interested in knowing the sequence at this, an this ancestral node, this is the ancestor of all the, uh, of all the vertebrates. So once we know the tree, and we have present day sequences, we can infer the most likely state at the ancestor, at the, for the ancestor, at each site in the sequence. And this is a statistical algorithm, it is, the, it's called maximum likelihood, and the idea simply is that the best estimate of the ancestral amino acid in the protein is the one that has the highest probability of giving rise to all of the present day states at that site in today's species. And the maximum likelihood protein sequence is then just the string of the maximum likelihood amino acids at each site. So once we know what the ancestral amino acid sequence was likely to be, we can use biochemistry uh, to synthesize a piece of DNA that will code for that ancient protein. The, we used to do this using a fairly tedious technique in the lab, now we do it by email. And that's true, there are companies now that we just send an email to and we tell them what sequence we want and they send it back to us. So once we have this piece of DNA that will produce the protein that uh, appears to be, have the same sequence as the ancient protein, then we can take that piece of DNA and put it into cells that we grow in a dish in the laboratory and have those cells express it. This is basic molecular biology. And we can do functional experiments to determine how it works. We can characterize its function, its structure, using the same sorts of techniques that molecular biologists use to study hormone receptors in humans to understand how they mediate processes of disease and so on. 
So this lets us bring the experimental rigor of molecular biology to questions about evolution in the deep past. So in my lab, we're interested in a specific gene family called the steroid hormone receptors. They are a beautiful model for studying the evolution of complexity, and here's why. These are the proteins that mediate the effect of steroid hormones on your body and the bodies of all other vertebrates and many other animals as well. So the way your endocrine system works, your hormones, is that steroid hormones are produced in the gonads or in the adrenal glands, and they circulate in the bloodstream. They are fat soluble, so they can diffuse through the membranes of cells all throughout your body. And in many of those cells are specific receptors for those hormones. So here's a cartoon that shows you how these things work. So the hormone can diffuse through the cell membrane, and the receptors are in the cell. And each hormone binds to its favorite receptor, and each receptor binds to its favorite hormone with incredible affinity and specificity. Once, once the receptor and the hormone bind, this event changes the shape of the receptor in a subtle way, and that allows it to bind to a specific sequence in, in the DNA called the response element, and then to attract other proteins that cause nearby genes to be expressed. So these are mediators. These are fundamentally molecular mediators. They transduce the signal, the presence of this hormone, into a response. And these responses include um, the major processes of regulating uh, uh, sexual dimorphism, so the difference between this, these very happy male and female um, elephant seals, which differ in body mass by a factor of about 10, is a tiny, tiny amount of testosterone. It's actually the equivalent of a couple of drops of testosterone in several railroad cars worth of serum. Um, they also regulate the stress response, such as um, that observed in spawning salmon. They're major players in, in disease as well. Estrogens, of course, are the major risk factor in breast cancer, androgens in prostate cancer. So there's a lot of good biomedical information that we can draw on in making evolutionary inferences. One other thing I want you to know, here's a picture of how this family of proteins works. I told you that when the hormone isn't there, they're not able to activate transcription. That's because there's a special part of the protein called the activation function helix, or AFH, colored red here. When, it's in, when, the, when the protein is not in complex with the ligand, it's down here and it's not doing anything. When the receptor binds the hormone in the middle there, that causes this remodeling where the activation function helix flips up here, and this assembles this new surface on the molecule, and this surface is where those proteins that activate transcription bind. So here are the players in, your, in the steroid hormone part of your endocrine system. You've got six receptors, two estrogen receptors, alpha and beta. You have an androgen receptor for testosterone and a progesterone receptor. You have then two other receptors for the hormones from your adrenal glands, the glucocorticoid receptor, or GR, which is activated primarily by cortisol, the stress hormone, and the mineralocorticoid receptor, which regulates salt and water balance in your body, as well as other processes regulated by a hormone called aldosterone, which comes from your adrenal glands. They are related to each other by a process of gene duplication. These genes got copied in the genome, much the way pseudogenes did, but they were expressed. And they diverge, yielding new functions along the way. Now, to, in my lab, we're interested in this question. This is our program. We want to know how all these receptors evolved their specific interactions with different hormones from a common ancestral gene way back when there was only one hormone receptor. Now, we work throughout this family. Tonight, I want to tell you two stories about one corner of the family up here. I want to tell you how the, how the MR's relationship with aldosterone and the GR's relationship with cortisol evolved. Okay. So here are the players now. The stars of the show are the GR and the MR. The GR is activated by this hormone co cortisol. Now, cortisol isn't a protein. It's actually modified from cholesterol. Uh, all of your steroid hormones are produced by modifications of cholesterol, and it regulates the stress response. The MR in you is activated by aldosterone. You and all other tetrapods 
vertebrates with four legs, most of them walk around on land. But aldosterone only exists in things with four legs. In things that don't have four legs, it's, it's a similar hormone called deoxycorticosterone or DOC. This is in fish and sharks and so on. We know that this is a recent evolutionary novelty. Aldosterone does not exist in species like fish and sharks and uh, jawless fishes. And the, and the reason, and I can tell you something about how it evolved. Now look at the structural similarity between these hormones. Oh, and it regulates salt and water balance, blood pressure, um, kidney function, and so on. Now look at the differences. There, it's a very subtle difference between these hormones. Eldo and cortisol both have an extra oxygen at what's called the 11 position. We number each of these carbons. So there's an oxygen here and here that's not present on DOC. Cortisol has a special oxygen at the 17 position, and aldosterone has a special oxygen at the 18 position. Those are the only differences, very subtle differences. Now we know how aldosterone evolved. It evolved because there's a special enzyme that only that only in tetrapods carries out this activity. So aldosterone is a recent novelty. So here's what was thought about the evolution of aldosterone and MR before we started working on it. Um, people assumed that because aldosterone is a recent hormone, the its receptor's affinity for it must also be recent. The hormone and the receptor evolve together. It makes sense. So we want to test that hypothesis, and if, and if it's true, we want to know how it happened. It sort of raises that complexity problem, doesn't it? How do you get the new hormone if the receptor's not already able to receive it, and how do you get the receptor if the hormone's not already there? If they're both happening here, we've got a problem. So we want to answer this question, how was this partnership uh, assembled, by looking back at the ancestral corticoid receptor, the common ancestor of the GR and the MR, just before it duplicated to yield these two different lineages. Now this is in the common ancestor. This is actually before the common ancestor of you and a salmon. So it's about 450 million years ago. It's a long time ago. So we want to resurrect that ancestral receptor. One way we can make this inference more, uh, more robust is by having more sequences to give us a better idea of what the ancestor actually had. So the first thing to do was to get more members of this family. So we particularly wanted to get um, those that branch off near the, near the time when, when this receptor existed. So we used molecular biology to isolate the receptors from two species of jawless fish, this beautiful sea lamprey and this very nice uh, Atlantic hagfish. They have only one member of the family because it hasn't been duplicated yet. We call it the corticoid receptor. And then cartilaginous fish, sharks, skates, and rays, have a GR and an MR, and we isolated those as well. We got their gene sequences, and we studied their function. And let me tell you how we study their function. We put them into cells in a dish, and we do molecular biology on them. Um, I'll, should I be more specific? Is that good enough? <laughs> Okay, so we use these cells that we can grow in an incubator in the lab, which express all of the other proteins that are necessary for steroid hormones to do their job, and they don't express any steroid receptors of their own. So it's very convenient blank slate for us to work with. We take the ligand binding domain of the receptor, and we hook it up to a DNA binding domain, and we put that into the cells, along with another piece of DNA, and that's this piece of DNA here, which consists of a binding site for this thing. So the, this protein now, with the receptor on it, sticks to the DNA here. And near that binding site is a luciferase gene. And luciferase is the enzyme that's responsible for making fireflies light up. So when we give, horm we can give hormones to these cells in the dish. And when we give them the right hormone, that turns this receptor on, causes expression of the, of the luciferase gene, and if we give it the right chemicals, the cells glow. And we can count, using a detector, exactly how much light there is. So we can relate the, the amount of hormone that we give to the transcriptional response, the gene expression response. Okay? It's actually not that hard to do at home, if you want to try it. Um, <laughs> 
So the first thing we did was we, we did this with the, with the lamprey and the hagfish receptors, which existed long before aldosterone ever evolved. And we tried a bu whole bunch of different hormones. Estrogens don't do anything. Testosterone doesn't do anything. Progesterone's pretty lame. Cortisol and deoxycorticosterone are great, and so is aldosterone. Well, that's weird, because this hormone doesn't exist yet. And it doesn't exist in these species either. Now, this is a lot of hormone. So the key thing is how sensitive are they to the hormone? So we do what's called the dose response analysis. Same experiment, but we give it increasing amounts of hormone. That's moving along the x-axis here. And we look at how, how the output of light increases as we give it more hormone. And as you would expect, you get more response as you give it more dose. What we didn't expect was that aldosterone is a better ligand, a better hormone for this receptor than cortisol. And that makes it look just like yours and my mineralocorticoid receptor, which was supposed to be derived. It doesn't look like the glucocorticoid receptor, which doesn't respond to aldosterone very well at all. Weird. Now, when we looked at the skate, that relative of the shark, which also doesn't make any aldosterone, both of its receptors like aldosterone better than cortisol. So that's very weird. When we plot these data on the phylogeny, we actually have to change our hypothesis. So we take a large number of gene sequences from present-day uh, steroid hormone receptors, and we infer the, the tree that relates them to each other, and that's right here. And then what we've done is we've colored in blue all the receptors that are sensitive to that new hormone aldosterone, and in red, the ones that aren't. And here's the ancestor we're interested in. Well, with all of these blue ones at the tips, it's much more parsimonious, much more likely and logical that this thing will be blue, will be aldosterone sensitive, than that it will be red. For this to have been aldosterone insensitive, you have to have independent gains of sensitivity to that hormone here, and here, and here, all in species that don't make the hormone. So that's very unlikely. So now we have a new hypothesis that aldosterone sensitivity is actually ancestral. So we want to test it, and we're going to do that by resurrecting that ancestral receptor. So the first thing to do is infer the sequence using the statistical methods I told you about before. So this just gives you an overview of what that sequence looks like. This is the proportion of the amino acids in the ancestral receptor that are identical to the sequence in these various receptors throughout the whole ligand binding domain. The blue ones are activated by aldosterone, and the red ones are the GRs that are not activated by aldosterone. So it's a little bit more similar to the aldosterone receptors, but not very much. It's not, not very exciting. But when we look at the residues that contact the ligand that are in the, inside the interior of the receptor and actually coordinate the ligand, then we see that the ancestral receptor is almost exactly the same as all of the aldosterone receptors and quite different from the aldosterone insensitive guy, consistent with our hypothesis. But we'd like to do an experiment. So here's the experiment. We do that same molecular biology thing that I showed you on this protein that's 450 million years old. And here are the results of that. Here's the dose response curve for the ancestral corticoid receptor for the three hormones. And you can see that it's a decent cortisol receptor, just as the MR is, and it's a much better ALDO and DOC uh, receptor. So this confirms our hypothesis. The ancestral receptor was aldosterone sensitive, and that is the ancestral state. Okay, now I gotta do one little technical thing here. Um, the way we measure sensitivity is with a number called the EC50, effective concentration 50. This is the dose of hormone, for DOC it would be right here, it's the dose of hormone that gets you halfway to maximal activation. So a lower EC50 means very sensitive hormone receptor pair. A high EC50 means you've got to give it a lot of hormone, it's a bad hormone for this receptor. This is an incredibly sensitive aldosterone receptor, as good or better than the human mineralocorticoid receptor. From now on, instead of showing you these horrible curves, I'm going to show you a bar graph where I'm graphing the EC50. It's actually the, if you're a math person, the log of the EC50. All you need to know is that a big bar means it's sensitive, a small bar means it's less sensitive. And you can see it's most sensitive to ALDO and DOC and less so to cortisol. So that says that the, uh, that the common wisdom that the MR sensitivity to aldosterone is, is derived 
was wrong, that the ancestor was more like an MR, and it's the GR that evolved a new function by losing the, ancestor, the ancestor's sensitivity to aldosterone, okay? Well, so what about complexity? What is that, what can we say about the evolution of the hormone receptor partnership, this supposedly irreducibly complex uh, system? We start out in the common ancestor of all the vertebrates with a single gene that's sensitive to aldosterone, DOC, and cortisol. Uh, people in the field say it's a promiscuous receptor. Then, after the jaw, its fish branch off, it duplicates into two genes, which initially have the same sensitivity. Here, after the sharks branch off, the GR loses its sensitivity to aldosterone. And it's much later, tens of millions of years after this, that aldosterone appears by the evolution of those enzymes that I told you about earlier. So it is a stepwise process. They don't appear together, the receptor sensitivity and the ligand. The receptor sensitivity comes first through this promiscuity, and the hormone comes around later. So we call this process molecular exploitation because the system is assembled by one, by one molecule recruiting another molecule that previously had a different function into a new partnership and thereby giving it a new function as a hormone. So in this case, the receptor precedes the ligand, and the, the new signaling complex of receptor and ligand occurred when, the, when this new hormone appeared and was immediately able to bind to the receptor. Okay, so that raises a big problem. What's the receptor doing? Why is it sensitive to aldosterone in the first place when the hormone isn't there? It appears to be pre-adapted for aldosterone when aldosterone comes around. So you've got two choices, or I can think of two choices. The, the creator wanted the receptor to be ready for aldosterone when it came around, so it was sort of predestined. Or there's, there's a more mechanistic reason, and I'm going to favor the more mechanistic one, obviously. So the ancestral corticoid receptor's sensitivity to this hormone that's not there has to be a byproduct of its affinity for the hormone that's really in that ancestral species. Now this is very common, this sort of promiscuity where one hormone and a structurally similar hormone will bind to the same receptor. That's why we can give, that's why patients can be given drugs, chemicals that interact with their hormone receptors. They're, it's not exactly the same as the hormone, it's shaped similarly. This is also why pesticides can bind to your estrogen receptors and turn them on at the wrong time. Receptors are only as specific as they need to be. So promiscuity is common in many proteins. Now, we think that DOC is almost certainly the ancestral hormone, and here's why. It's present in all of those species. It is as ancient as the ancestral CR. It's still the ligand for the MR in, uh, in teleos, and it is a great ligand for the ancestor. So here's the hypothesis. That activation of the receptor by aldosterone is a structural byproduct of its sensitivity to its real hormone, DOC. Well, that's a structural hypothesis, and we're going to test it using structural biology. So here's what we did. We determined the precise atomic map of the ancestral receptor protein using X-ray crystallography. So proteins, if they're grown in the appropriate, uh, if they're put in the appropriate solution, like salt or sugar or ice will form a crystal. And this is actually the crystal of the ancestral, uh, the ancestral receptor protein. We can then take that to a particle accelerator. Uh, this was actually done by our collaborator, Eric Ortland, a uh, biochemist at Emory University. Um, he, he did the structural work I'm going to tell you about. Take this crystal to this stadium-sized particle accelerator. You could put Austin, Austin Stadium in the middle of this. This is the brightest, um, this produces the brightest X-ray beams in this hemisphere. And those X-rays are, are shown through the crystal, and the atomic, the pattern of atoms in the crystal causes the X-rays to diffract in a specific pattern. If you put film here, the, the pattern of these X-rays will show up on the film. And you can then work backwards 
from this pattern to determine the precise map of where the atoms are that would produce a pattern like this. That you can't try at home unless you have one of these in your basement. <laughs> so here's the, the, this is the first crystal structure of an ancient protein. Here, here it is. It's in complex with aldosterone. It's got its activation function helix in the active conformation. And it is remarkably similar to the structure of the present day human MR with which it shares its function, aldosterone sensitivity. You can see the incredible similarity and they're even incredibly the same color. <laughs> but why does it bind aldosterone? That's the big question. So in partnership with Eric, we solved the structure with, um, with all three hormones, aldosterone, DOC, and cortisol. And what this shows you is a part of the structure, the ligand pocket. These are the ligands superimposed on each other. And these are the side chains of the amino acids that are close to the ligand. And if you can see, there are actually three for each one. They superimpose so perfectly on each other, you can barely see any difference. The receptor binds all three hormones in exactly the same way. Doesn't require any adjustment to accommodate the extra oxygens that are present on, on aldosterone. And the most important part is there's all this space here above the places where the oxygens are. So there's room for the receptor to accommodate a slightly bulkier hormone. So this corroborates our hypothesis that by binding to DOC, it has the fortuitous ability to bind aldosterone when aldosterone comes around. There just happens to be extra room at the end. So this fortuitous fit creates a evolutionary potential when the hormone actually comes around. Now, I actually want to skip a bunch of stuff because I should finish in about five minutes. So let me just do this. Um, I'm going to tell you just half of chapter two. So that tells us how the MR aldosterone partnership evolved. But then there's another pair, cortisol and GR, which are quite specific for each other. There's no promiscuity here. So we want to know how that happened. First thing we have to know is when it happened. So we're going to resurrect and functionally characterize successive ancestors moving up the tree. This is the one I already showed you. Here's the glucocorticoid receptor and the common ancestor of you and a shark. And it still looks like the ancestor. It's still sensitive to aldosterone and DOC. Here's the ancestral GR2, which is the GR and the common ancestor of you and a tuna fish. And that one looks just like a GR. So that tells us that it's right in here, in this interval, it's about 30 million years, still a pretty long time, that the function switched. And if we want to know how it happened, we can look at the mutations that occurred during that period of history. Now there were five that occurred, there were, sorry, there were 36 which occurred during this interval but only five of them are good candidates for causing the GR to evolve its new function. And the reason for that is that they're diagnostic, which means they're conserved in one state in all the guys that have the, have the new function, in a different state in all the guys that have the old function. So we want to test those. And it turned out when we tested them that there, were, that there was a combination of two. Here's all the one and two-fold combinations. There's a combination of two that get you from the ancestor over to cort being cortisol specific, just like the present day rat GR. It's not quite as insensitive to aldosterone, but it's a thousand fold less than the ancestor and almost the same exact cortisol specificity. So it only takes two mutations at specific sites, if you get just the right ones, which happen to occur during history, to evolve this new function. Now, I want to show you how it happened, and this will be the last thing that I do today. We actually have a puzzle here that's kind of like our complexity puzzle for hormones and receptors. We need two mutations. Here's the ancestor with the ancestral function. Here's the derived guy that now prefers cortisol to aldosterone by, uh, b by an order of magnitude. But how do we get there? We have to have one before the other. If we do this one first, we have a radical eff negative effect on function. This receptor is a very poor, uh, is very insensitive to all three hormones. These are 
concentrations much higher than are known in any organism. So this is very unlikely path for evolution because it's going through a deleterious intermediate. But what if we do the other one first? If we do this one first, we have almost no effect on function. But once that one's in place, then this one can be tolerated in this background and it switches the function. So this seems to be permissive. There's only one way evolution can go. It has to do this permissive change first. And once the permissive change is in place, then it can have the mutation that gives you a new function. Now, that we have discovered in the course of our work quite a few examples of these so-called permissive mutations, where you have a basically neutral change that sets the stage for selection to favor a later change to give you a new function. But if you didn't have the first change, you couldn't tolerate the crucial function switching mutation. There are a number of examples of that. I'm going to skip them and go right to the conclusion here. Oh, I got to show you the movie. All right, I'm going to show you the movie, and this will be the last thing. All right, so we wanted to know how these two things occur, why these two changes will give you a cortisol specific receptor from, from the ancestral one that responds to all the hormones. So we compared the structures. So here's the ancestral structure. It's got cortisol in the pocket, and it can also accommodate DOC or aldosterone. Here's that oxygen at the 17 position that's only found on cortisol. And here are the two sites that are going to change. Now, when we go to the one with the derived function, we've got two mutations. One is, here's the permissive one. It doesn't do much. This, it looks like it's close to the ligand, but it's actually way back into the screen. It doesn't do much to the structure. But the second one down here is the one that really changes the structure. And if you did this on its own, it, you're going to see that it, it causes a kink that's going to unwind this part of the protein, open up all this space down here, and destabilize the protein, which is why it's so bad on its own. But if this is already present, you're going to see that this gets moved down, forms a new bond with that, with that group that's present only on cortisol, and it's going to uniquely stabilize the complex with cortisol. So here's the, here's the structure of the GR2. That's cool. You see why I wanted to show you. <laughs> OK, so here's what happened. This one, on its own, if this weren't present, you would have all this space here, all this space down here, all this space up here, and the receptor becomes a bad receptor. But if this one has changed first to, um, to this residue that is capable of forming a bond to this group right here, it stabilizes the receptor only with cortisol, and you get a cortisol-specific receptor. Okay. So now I can skip the other stuff. This, these are the other permissive substitutions I was going to show you about. Okay. So in conclusion, what we've discovered in modern biology, molecular biology, in ma all of its many manifestations, biochemistry, development, genomics, overwhelming evidence of common descent and adaptation by natural selection. Now, what have we learned specifically from our work on these hormone receptors? First, we've seen that new interactions in complex systems evolve by recruiting old parts for new functions. These systems seem irreducibly complex. But they only seem that way if you forget about the fact that the function of a molecule can change over time. And it may have had a different function in the past from what it has in the present. So these complex systems are assembled by co-opting old parts for new functions. And the fact that proteins are only as specific as they need to be at the time provides the raw material for that process to take place. We've seen that. Um, I actually didn't show you that part. But I did show you something that's interesting about these permissive mutations. And it implies an important role for historical contingency in evolution. We said that a permissive mutation has to happen for the mutation that switches the function to be tolerated. But that permissive mutation has no benefit in itself. So imagine if we could go back in time, if we could rewind the, the tape of life, as Stephen Jay Gould used to say, and let history run again. What's the probability that that permissive mutation would occur again? Well, if it has no effect on function, it's not going to be favored by selection. It's not deterministic. It's very likely that that mutation would be 
would be missed entirely. And if that's true, then the conditions required to evolve the new function wouldn't have been present. If that's true, it means that the biology that we have today is just one roll of the evolutionary dice. And we could have ended up with something very different. Now, adaptation is always going to occur in one way or another. But if you appreciate this historical contingency, it's, it really shines a light on sort of the amazing, fortuitous nature of our biology, how beautiful it is, and how seriously we, we ought to take protecting it. Finally, let me say that when we open up Darwin's black box, what did we find? More evidence for evolution and more fascinating evolutionary processes. So I need to thank, above all, the members of my lab who did all the hard bench work, the experiments that I told you about today. In particular, Jamie Bridgham, who's the manager of my lab, and she did all of the experiments on the ancestral corticoid receptor. Uh, these are collaborators. Funding comes from these organizations. I'd like to thank the Humanities Center again for sponsoring this, and I'd like to thank you for coming. I'd be happy to take questions. So there are microphones in the two aisles. I have a Is question. Hi. Mm -hmm. Do the animals with only one corticoid receptor? Sorry, the, the ancestral receptor that you reconstructed. Um, in, in hagfish and lampreys, what hormone does that bind? The lamprey and the hagfish receptor is activated by aldosterone deox and deoxycorticosterone and cortisol. We think deoxycorticosterone is likely to be the real hormone because they make it. So DOC is the hormone that, that the jawless yeah. fishes have. And does it evoke a stress response or a salt balance response? So both? it appears that it probably does both, that you have one receptor and regulating all of these processes. And later, when you have a duplication, you can have more specific independent regulation of the two processes by different receptors. Yes. Um, how can the debate or pseudo-debate between uh, creation science and intelligent de design continue in the light of new evidence and strong evidence? And does this mean that uh, evolutionary uh, biologists and scientists are not upholding their end of the battle in this debate? Um, it's not, well, it's not a scientific debate. It's. Uh, political debate. It's one about what we ought to be teaching in schools irrespective of the science. Um, as, as I implied, the science is very clear. There's no controversy about, uh, about evolution as fact. So it's really a matter of who can be persuaded of this. And the strategy by the creationists has been to go into places where they can persuade school boards and they can persuade governments that their point of view ought to, be, um, ought to be taught in high school science classes. That's obviously problematic if you care about the rigor of, of, of public science education. So what do scientists have to do? There was a period when scientists were staying away from these debates because they didn't want to dignify them. And it didn't work very well. There was a spread of this sort of, these creationist initiatives. But over the last five or seven years, um, the scientific organizations have changed that strategy and were extremely involved, for instance, in the Dover trial in Pennsylvania, um, expert witnessing, public education, and so on. I think we have to keep doing more and more of this. Um, as uh, someone who, uh, uh, during the infancy of molecular biology, just took a few courses in it, I was just astounded at uh, how this is uh, progressed uh, since I hadn't been paying attention to it. And uh, uh, specifically, uh, the, uh, the uh, 
uh, pictures you showed of being able to determine where the sites are on the proteins and how they fold up. Uh, how on earth are you able to do that? And uh, this technology must be quite new. And what do you speculate we might you might find in the near future, given this advantage? Really what's new is the synthesis of techniques. So protein crystallography has been around for a decade. It's gotten much more precise with the better beam lines and new technologies have made it a lot easier to do. So it doesn't take years and years to get um, the structure of a single protein the way it used to. The experiments that I showed you, however, are mostly pretty routine types of experiments for molecular biologists. What's new about this approach, and my lab isn't the only one taking this approach, there are a number of evolutionary labs that are bringing functional biology, molecular biology, biochemistry together, is this synthesis to bring experiments to questions about the mechanisms of evolution. I have a question. Um, Cannot human beings develop life forms which uh, do not actually evolve from anything, and just create new life forms? I mean, isn't that possible? Can human beings create new life forms? Yeah, which did not evolve in this order that you... You mean by engineering? Yeah, by engineering. Well, in a sense, whenever we do a transgenic experiment where we put the gene of one species or a manipulated gene into another species, I suppose that's what we're doing. Yeah. So if we find evidence for that, that would be like uh, some alien species has created a life form. I mean, is it possible to look for life is forms? Is it possible that what? That you find life forms which uh, did not evolve directly on Earth, but uh, somehow came from the space or somewhere else? I mean, is it possible to? So if yeah. those exist, yeah. we don't have any evidence of them because of the gene sequences of everything that we've looked at falls nicely into the sort of hierarchical tree of life that we've seen. There aren't any outliers of species that have different biochemical basis, different kinds of gene sequences, different, different types of molecular biology that would suggest an independent origin. You've shown that the, uh, you've shown well that um, one type of gene structure can be, um, can be changed into a similar type of gene structure by evolution, but what about the creation of an entirely new type of gene structure? Like, um, can a um, non-hormone receptor genome be adapted to create a hormone receptor genome without something like that being present in the genome structure already? Yeah, this is a really good question. So most of the genome, most of the genes are hierarchically organized into these gene families where the common ancestry is quite clear. But then, and some of those families can be related to other families as super families. But eventually you get to a point where the origin of each family is not clear. So we know that new genes can get created by fusing together a portion of one gene with, a, with another gene. We know there are cases where what was previously um, non-coding DNA, just um, either regulatory or random sequence in the genome, begins to be expressed and it may produce a short or a medium or under some circumstances even a long protein that can then be sculpted by evolution. So there are clearly mechanisms that have been observed for the generation of new genes and new gene families. But there's, a, there's at the root of this tree of genes a murky area where we can't trace back all of the gene families through their history. And that remains currently a sort of historical black box. This is not a question, but it's a comment. In the 1960s, I was working in this field but using, of course, no, none of these techniques. I was using cytological techniques to look at the receptors. And so I was, for example, looking at uh, the ste corticosteroid receptors in the pituitary of fish and looking at the cytology of the fish pituitary in organ culture. 
following treatment with all sorts of different steroids in order to see which ones affected the receptor, which are then measured by changes in cytology. This is much more beautiful in technique. It's, it's just imagine doing that this th these days. Well, thank you. You know, this work builds on decades of comparative endocrinology in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and 80s that sort of fell out of favor, and then it was all molecular endocrinology, looking at how the human and model system proteins work, and now there's a new interest in, in the evolutionary and the comparative questions, bringing those mechanistic approaches and data to light on the sorts of questions that were looked at decades ago. evolutionary forensics uh, creating um, evidence of <coughs> genes that existed prior to the ones we can find in evidence now. Could you just sort of go out on a limb and speculate to the origins of the common, or if there is a singular common ancestor of all life on the planet and uh, speculate as to how that may have come to be? So I... Not, not a, as a religious question, but as a chemical reaction question. You know, how so there are a number of theories for how you get that universal common ancestor. Darwinian evolution doesn't really tell us much about it. Um, Darwin's theory of evolution and the work that, the kind of work we're doing today, tells you how you get from a common ancestral life form that diversifies into the life forms that we see today. But that question of the first origin is an open one. It's an open one scientifically, and I think it's an open one religiously. It's, sci it's something that science currently can't give you a definitive answer for. Yeah. 